You may say, well, how did it happen that a diplomat ends up in helicopters in Vietnam? And uh, I, I remember driving across the old steel mesh bridge, uh, bridge at the north end of Dubuque in my 55 Mercury in the early 60s going up to Madison to take the Foreign Service exam. And you know, one, it's a, I learned kind of a great thing about America is that there can be a moment when a kid who went to Loris College could be on equal footing with all of those from Harvard and Princeton and Yale who usually got in the Foreign Service. And I went up and took the test, and lo and behold, I passed it, and I passed the oral exam. In 19, August of 1967, I walked through the doors of the State Department, and here are these visions of my future going through my head. London, Paris, <laughs> Vienna, <laughs> Stockholm, if I had to. But I was going to be sipping aperitifs and in chandelier ballrooms and discussing the nuances of international affairs, which is what I thought diplomats did. And then before I knew what had happened, they said, well, you're under 26, you're male, you haven't been in the military, you're not married. And I was in Vietnamese language training and off to Vietnam, not to the embassy in Saigon or to the regional headquarters or to the provincial capital. I'm in a single engine plane landing on a road in a district to become a rural development advisor. And I'm out there working in eight villages and I learned two great lessons of my life. The first is that the combination of rural roads and agricultural technology of the new rice could do things to fight an insurgency that couldn't be accomplished with B-52s or with troops on the ground, that it could get at the heart of an insurgency. And I'd use that 30 years later to destroy the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. And the second lesson I learned was that my contributions would come not in the salons of Europe, but in rural areas of other countries. Now, my tour was coming to an end. We had to do a year and a half. And uh, the State Department sent me a message and said, guess what? We're sending you to Harvard, you're going to study about labor relations, and then you're going to be assigned to Europe to an embassy to report on European labor movements. My dream to come true. And I wrote them back and said, I don't want to go to Harvard. I don't want to go to Europe. I want to stay in Vietnam. And I ended up staying for six years. And they uh, asked, well, what do you want to do next? And I said, I want to be the district senior advisor in Duc Tone District. <coughs> where I hadn't been yet. And they said, well, this is a very military district. It's got a big Viet Cong base area. It's next to the Vinh Long Army airfield, uh, it's at, uh, which was overrun during Tet. Uh, to have a civilian in that job, but the man who ran things said, I approve, you're going. So I show up, and here's all this military team of captains and sergeants, and, uh, and I come in, and I'm a civilian, and now I'm the head of the team. And uh, I learned a lesson in leadership big, tall, six foot five inch African American sergeant said, no disrespect, sir, but there are no civilians in my chain of command. And uh, I said, well, sorry, his name was Bobby Chase. No, I'll never forget him. And I said, well, Sergeant Chase, tomorrow you and I will go out and we'll go out with the troops and, uh, and walk through the rice paddies and into the swamps and into the VC base area with the South Vietnamese troops as advisors. And we went and we did that all day long and we got back to our uh, base at night and he said to me, sir, you went where we go, you did what we do, I'll follow you anywhere. And so that was, that was the lesson to me. And I said, I can't send people out to do things and take risks and die that I won't do myself. So I got the helmet, and the next day when the helicopters came, I put it on and went out for the dozens and dozens and dozens of times uh, over the next six or seven months, every night, 
We'd go out with uh, five helicopters combing through the VC base area, hoping they'll shoot at us so we can bring the guns down on them, or running air mobile operations where we had all these helicopters and we'd load up troops and take them there. Uh, doing the night medevacs when nobody could find their way into the overrun outpost and uh, the uh, helicopters couldn't get there, but I was the one who knew the way and I got on and rode in and we went in twice to take out 30 wounded Vietnamese troops. And it was the you know, experience that uh, showed me you know, what, what this could be like and what was involved and was what I had to do. Uh, I, ever since then, it seems like uh, all of my assignments took me to remote places, out of the way places, um, that, and I was either shot at, wounded, blown up, or under death threat in every foreign service assignment I had, much to the dismay of my wife, <laughs> who was thinking of London and Paris. And, uh, I was uh, hitting a rocket attack in Saigon, I was almost captured by the Khmer Rouge along the Cambodian border. Uh, I uh, had bullets crack over my head in Gaza, and I know, I know the dirt in Gaza because when the shots crack over your head, you get down on the ground and burrow in as deep as you can. In Lebanon, to go through the Syrian lines and the PLO lines and, uh, and reporting uh, on there. In the Philippines, it was number two on the New People's Army list to be, uh, to be murdered and assassinated. I had six bodyguards. The most dangerous thing we could do would be to take my wife and children with me in, in the car. My kids all have memories of that because they always wanted to play with the Uzis that the bodyguards had uh, and this. And, uh, and, uh, and in Cambodia, when uh, my wife and uh, three children had arrived, on, uh, on June the 17th, and it was a, few, a couple of weeks after my birthday, and our house was hit with a rocket and blew all the windows in and into our, into our bedroom, and suddenly it's ringed in uh, automatic weapons fire everywhere, and uh, grabbed our three children and threw them on the floor and covered them with our bodies. And I learned the lesson of how much you really love your children when you're laying there and praying and praying as hard as you can that the bullet that comes through the window hits you and not them. I, uh, I learned a lot about ability of small teams to make a big difference in Duc Tone, uh, in Governor Ray's office, dealing with refugees and, and, and providing the moral leadership that he did to the world in saving the boat people, in uh, working on the Iowa National Guard that's now such an incredibly proud institution but was on tough times back in, uh, in the late 1970s. And in Phnom Penh, uh, where uh, we went out and protected uh, endangered political figures, uh, even though we had, had no Marines at our embassy. They said it was too dangerous to come to Cambodia. And we were there. And at the World Food Prize, where I hope you meet some of my members of my staff who are, who are here today. Uh, we've been working for the last 10 years to make this a proud part of Des Moines and a great asset for our state. But I learned most of all what it means to be an American. You know, funny thing about being up in the helicopters is you don't know anybody's name. You all have call signs. I was Delta Six. I think Congressman Boswell was Warrior Six. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the other is you'd be talking to Outlaw 3-3 three, three, or Light Horse 2-1 or Dust Off 4-7, uh, Black Pony 16. And you didn't know anybody's name. You might never have seen their face. You didn't know if they were black or white, what their religion was whether they were military or civilian. All you knew was that when an American was in trouble, you went. And if you were in trouble, they would come. That was the bond that united us all in combat. 
And that's the meaning for me of this medal today. I am so proud, Congressman Boswell, to wear this medal. I am so proud to be an American, and I am so incredibly proud to be an Iowan. Thank you all so much for being here.